Derek Craven would never. He would never. Except for all of the things that he would do. I mean, there are a lot of things Derek Craven would. I can't remember. Today I was trying to think about why we coined Derek Craven would never. It was about some other hero that we didn't like. Yeah. Which, oh. Who we will not name on of this course. podcast. Largely because I don't remember who it was. Um, And we were like, Derek Craven would never. You know what my my other really funny memory is, is... For two years in a row, and I think it was February 4th, the first time you and I talked about Derek Craven was on a February 4th, and then we did it again, and I was like, it's Derek Craven Day. I know. I believe I've, yeah, I put it in my calendar so I'd remember. (laughs) We're going to give away, like, gift cards. You know what we need to do? Oh, my God, Sarah. Sarah, I've had the best idea. You know what we need to do? We need to get Warby Parker to, like, (laughs) right? Give away eyeglasses! I mean, that would be amazing, but do you think that we're popular enough for that? I mean, I don't know. What we should do is get Warby Parker to sponsor that one episode of the podcast, and if you use the code Derek Craven, you get 10% off. I mean, hello? (laughs) This is, we are marketing genius I. Uh Uh-huh. For sure, you guys, we're going to get to uh, February 4th, and we'll make sure we do a thing. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. Um, maybe we'll uh, talk to Lisa Klepis then, because she's my friend now. That's right. Because we spent the weekend together. You guys, I spent the weekend with Lisa Klepis. <laughs> I had such FOMO. It was not even oh, funny. I would get amazing. these texts from Sarah, and I was just like, okay, that's not it cool. It was fucking glorious. Um, And you guys, can I tell you the best part? The, like, the best thing was that I was sitting with her at dinner <laughs> one night, and I said, it was just the two of us, and I was like, um, so I'm doing this podcast, and I was sort of, Jen had been like, you have to tell her we're doing Dreaming of You, and um, <laughs> so I was trying to kind of, like, ease my way into telling her about the podcast and so instead of just saying, and we want to do Dreaming of You as an episode, because I'm immensely like nervous around Lisa because she's Lisa. I was like, well, last season we did, you know, all of Immortals After Dark. And she went, oh, I love Immortals After Dark. And I thought like, oh, she's just being like that kind of person. Who's like, so kind, like kind and excited. And you guys, she went book for book with me. She also loves Rune. Hello. She also has a problem with the the gay romance one oh, and the yeah. like virginity weirdness that goes on Ugh. there. And I was like, Lisa, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. Jen, I taught her about take the finger. I taught her what would Cressley do. She was like, I am here for it. I mean, you guys, Lisa has read every IAD book <sighs> and she remembers them all the way we do. Also has trouble with titles. And so, big fan of Lothair. Big fan of McReeve. Here's what I'm going to say, Sarah. I'm just real glad right now at this moment that she's too busy to usurp me and become the actual <laughs> co-host of yeah. Faded Mates with you. You are fucking lucky that we are done because I'd be like, Jen, you're out. Please, <laughs> <So>, by Lisa. <laughs> you would, I would be so out. And I'd just be like real sad. Like, <laughs> oh, those are my glory days. Aww. But welcome to Faded Mates with Sarah and Jen, everyone. It's season two, and we're beginning our deep dive episodes this week with Lisa Kleypas's uh, Dreaming of You, the first book that blooded us. Though oh, not yeah. the first, like, book in time that blooded us, but the first right. book that blooded both of us. Yeah. Well, and that I think also, like, our friendship. So I'm going to add that in there, too. I think that's why it's a really good place for us to start. Right. Well, we knew we loved each other. Well, you knew you loved me, I think, when I tweeted, there are two kinds of Lisa Kleypas heroes, those who think Derek Craven is the best and those who are wrong. (laughs) And every time you retweet that, people get so mad (laughs) in my mentions. And I'm sorry, you guys, but like, it's time for you all to appreciate your own flaws 
And that's just the way it is. We ha- we all have to be wrong sometimes. Um, we have a lot to talk about. Today. So much to talk about. Um, this book was published in 1994 by Avon Books. Thank you, Avon. It was edited by a woman named Ellen Edwards, who also edited Lord of Scoundrels and a wow. bunch of other big, big books in the 90s, including, I think, Gentle Rogue um, and possibly The Black Lion. Wow, uh, that's amazing. I'm going to check with Avon and we'll put it in, in show notes. Um, but Ellen Edwards was a big, big deal uh, back then, and she edited. I mean, she clearly had a sort of the eye of the eye of a genius because a lot was going on. Oh, and Susan Elizabeth Phillips, I think, back in the day. Huh. So I think, um, you know, a lot was going on, and she like she could just tell. She could tell when a when a book was gonna was gonna hit. Interesting. The zeitgeist. Does one hit the zeitgeist? I don't know if anyone intends to hit the zeitgeist. I think it just, like, magically happens. But yeah, I'm really interested in one of the things you said last week, and so I wanted to remember it is, you had sort of said, like, I mean, a lot of big books come out in this, like, couple of years. Like, Uh, Word of Scoundrels is 95, I think, right? 94, 95. Yeah. So, and you were kind of like, I think it has something to do with what's happening then. Well, I don't know. I don't yeah. know for sure um, because how could you, right? But I've sure. spent so much time in my life talking about the fact that, um, you know, that romance is relevant to the world that it's being written in. And so, you know, so 1992 was – so again, this is an American focused question, right? Because when we talk about when I talk about romance, I'm talking specifically about romance in America. Um, and I think that there are some interesting things here. One, I, 1992 is an election year. It's yeah. a Bill Clinton election year. Yep. Oops, sorry. Um, I just apologize for my microphone. <laughs> As one does. <laughs> Anyway, um, it's a Bill Clinton election day, election year. Um, and if the books are published in 93, 94, 95, sure. that means they're all being written sort of on the heels of the of Clinton, the, yeah. the presidential election. So, Which I don't know if people remember, but I do because that please, was, I believe, the first. It. You're very I, old. I'm very old. I'm pretty <laughs> sure, you guys, I think that's the first president I voted for. Was that election? Because I, I don't, I mean, that feels right. My first election was 1996, Bill Clinton. So that makes okay. sense. And I think the thing that I really remember um, all the allegations about his sexual, like his cheating and his affairs. And like the and like you know it's not clear to me like which election it was, but like the the national conversation about whether or not you could be like a powerful man who had this like kind of tawdry background and whether or not that was disqualifying. And certainly on the heels of Anita Hill, which would have been mid eighties, which I was really too young to kind of like take in the same way I was aware of it, but it didn't really impact me. Mm-hmm. You know, so I don't know. I mean, I think that whole conversation just felt like really on the forefront from what I remember. Like, yeah, I mean, I do think that that was later in the game. Okay. Okay. Um, I think so. The 92 election was George H.W. Bush running for a second term during in the midst of the Iraqi war. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, President and Bill Clinton coming in as sort of this like forgotten middle class kind of like down home oh yeah dad like possibly daddy i don't know what do we call it. i don't know i don't know uh, i don't want to go that way oh my god i'm right? like my whole body just um, shivered and like, not in a good way charismatic right like the opposite of george hw bush um and so i think and then he came in the like there was sort of this general sense of, and he came in and then the war ended and there was sort of everything sort of the the globe this was long before just sort of 24 hour war all the time right yeah. and so there was this sort of sense of peacefulness um in the world and a kind of sense that like 
large swaths of America. I mean, like he won a significant portion of the vote. And so I wonder if there is something to be said for this idea that like large swaths of America were sort of thinking about um, being taken care of. Like and they were um, because they're he really did sort of win a wide swath of the middle class. Like this was Mm -hmm. not this was a time when we weren't so when presidents could win and it wasn't like, well, there was an election and now we wait 25 years to know yeah, who right. actually won. Right. Uh, but that said, um, I think like, I, I, I don't honestly know. I think, I think yeah. there was a real sense of like calm in which case it made sense that we were starting to look at things like, Blue collar heroes, yeah. Right, Derek is not even Derek is a working class hero, yeah. Um, invented by Lisa, right? Like, uh, the, prior to Lisa, yes, okay. There was um Judith Ivory's The Proposition, which I think was. Now I'm gonna, I have to Google it. Um, is that the I, one you've talked about? This one before the rat yeah, catcher. Yeah, he's a rat catcher. Um, but. You know, can you name that many, like, working class heroes prior to this? Oh, no, that came after. It was 1999. Oh, interesting. Interesting. I think about a lot of those. um, I think there were a lot of working people in category romance. Mm, Right? mm -hmm. Like, I feel like that was, I really was on the come up. Like, there were, you know, they were, like, doctors and, like, regular guys. It wasn't, like, every category here was a billionaire. Um, but it, that's different in contemporary. I just feel like it's different when it makes that leap to historical. Yeah. Well, I mean, you think about those McNaught contemporaries, right? Where like it was working like like career people, working women and men. Um, and I mean, they we often talk about the 80s as being sort of the working girl romance where like – you know, women put on their sneakers and their power suits and they went to work in the romance novel. Yeah. And then fell in love with their boss, which is still a thing. Yeah. So um, it is. <laughs> I mean, it's not like that one anywhere. But no, you're absolutely right. But what's fascinating is when I think about transformative texts in the romance, and that's what we are talking about, to, like with this season, we said, okay, yeah. we want it to be the books that blooded us, but you made it really clear that you didn't just want it to be the books that we love. Like we're not reading The Black Lion for a reason, right? Like, right. You wanted to talk about books that taught us how romance could be or like expanded the genre in some way or another. Right. And for me, Derek Craven does that because he is a post – he is a um, a line in the sand for romance heroes. Prior to him, you almost never saw a working class hero in historicals. And after him, working class heroes existed. Always kings. Always rich. Sure. Always kings. But like he has that terrible well, accent, which we should talk about because we got comments on it on, right. on uh, Twitter. You know, he has that Cockney accent. He has the crooked teeth. He's scarred. He was right. born in a drain pipe. Like, <laughs> he was all of these things. Sure. Well, and even Sarah, like, one of my, like, f- like, there's a line where it's, like, after, you know, at the end where it's kind of like they didn't care about society. And because they didn't, society was desperate for their approval. So even Sarah you know, has this very different background, at least to me, right? Like she's the, you know, she's a writer. She's got this, she's has these elderly parents who um, kind of allow her to have a lot of freedom because they know that they're not going to be around for her entire life. I mean, like, so she is even a really interesting heroine to me in the sense of like what she brings to the table, which is like her interest in um, like her own, her own pursuits, I mean, I mean, I, Derek Craven, I think we're going to talk about a lot, but I don't want to like, you know, drop the ball on Sarah, who I think is a really interesting character in a lot of ways. I agree. I, and I want to talk, I mean, so here's the thing. We have been paying attention, Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we announced that it was going to be Derek Craven, uh, this first book, a lot of people on Twitter started reading a lot of people on Twitter started reading, I think, tangentially. They're not listening, but they're, they you sure. know, saw people talking about it in the ether. 
and I started reading it and we've been paying attention. We've been seeing a lot of the like concerns about the text and we want to tackle all of them. I do just want to say one more thing about the 90s, the early 90s. Um, In 1990, there was a recession, which is actually part of why George H.W. Bush was not like the theory is like he was partially not reelected because there was such a recession. Right. um, Which ended in 1991 and then kind of – like gave or ended like slowly was ending in 1991 and gave Bill Clinton the ability to talk about like how the middle class, the working class, like the working right. poor, like these people deserved a voice. Although one might argue that cutting welfare uh, <laughs> Bill Clinton was not. <laughs> yeah. Right. Anyway, we're not going to get into that. Um, the point is that that kind we know that recessions tend to um, deliver juggernauts. In the romance world, we've seen. Oh, interesting. It. We saw it in 2008 with the 2008 recession leading into Fifty Shades. Um, we saw it in the post 9 11 uh, economic downturn leading into um, Paranormal. Yeah. That's so, interesting. like, when recessions happen, so this is one of those things where, like, right now I'm looking at the news and I'm seeing everybody talk about recessions, although I'm such a West Wing fan that I have Josh Lyman in my head going, we don't call it that, we call it a bagel. <laughs> um, so I see us like walking into this, like hearing this word over and over again. And I think to myself, like, you know, well, that's shitty for everyone in the whole world, but also like, maybe we are about to see something completely different happen, yeah. um, in romance. So, um, you know, the historian in me is excited. Steve Amendem will be thrilled. We love Steve. Hi, Steve. We love you. So where do you want to start? Should we, I mean, do we do, last year we did like a quick overview of the books. I feel like maybe we still need to do that. Okay, sure. That makes sense. Okay. Who is Derek? Me is Derek. 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 Is it Derek? It's Derek. 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 So Derek Craven is our hero and he is, as Sarah said, born in a drain pipe, but like is now a self-made man. And he runs the essentially premier gaming establishment in London. And every wealthy man wants to gamble there and every beautiful woman wants to like drink there. Although, of course, not like the good ladies. And um, at the beginning of the book, he is being chased down an alley in, I don't know, some the rookery, probably some terrible part of London, right, at that point. And Mm -hmm. he is um, attacked by some folks who, like, slash his face, and he thinks they're trying to kill him. And out of kind of nowhere, this little voice is like, stop it. And it is our heroine, (laughs) right, Sarah. And she is an author. And she has been doing – she has written sort of a really famous book where she – did a bunch of interviews with prostitutes and created um, a character named Matilda that is a composite of sort of all their stories. And one of the reasons it's really famous is there it has an ambiguous ending, right? It's very Lady or the Tiger. People come to the text and kind of fight and argue about what they think Matilda's real end is. Or like the Sopranos, to use a more current, maybe, um... <laughs> a reference and she saves him and gets him back to the the club and while she's there you know she, they, she sort of realizes that this is the perfect way for her to do new re- research for her new book so everyone in the club from the maids to the doormen to worthy which is um Derek craven's is it factotum is that mm-hmm. how you say that That's word right handles the whole club business yeah like essentially loves the fact that sarah is there and they are like she's working and she like sort of slowly but surely takes over Derek's club and he is fascinated by her even though he can't stand that he is yes he realizes that this you know back to that alpha not knowing what feelings are Mm. he realizes that his fascination with her portends something very dangerous to his very soul and he wants her out of there yeah and he steals her spectacles that's all you need to know and yeah and you need to know spectacles play a part in this yes um, so, all right, I want to start with, I want to start with sex work. We yeah. Should we start there or should we like lead into it? Because I also want to talk about, I want to talk about sex. 
in yeah. general in this book because I think – so one of the things I think Lisa does so well over the course of her whole oeuvre, right? I mean, and we're going to talk about talismans too and other things, which, I mean, we've talked about before, the things right. that I love about Lisa's writing. But one of the things that she does so well is tackle sex in a really interesting um way that rides a very fine line of like historical and modern. And what I mean mm-hmm. by that is at the very start of this book, Sarah has written Matilda, the book, the, her own book. And there's a moment where she says like Matilda had to learn that prostitution was not like a proper life for her. Yeah. And at first blush for a modern reader, in fact, uh, somebody on Twitter, like, really called this out as a problematic way of, th- of thinking. And absolutely it is. Um, and for a reader in 2019, that being there right in the beginning of the book is a really interesting choice, right? Because it sort of sets us up for, like, Sarah to potentially be kind of, like, morality. Oh, like, right. The morality like, police. It's And it's unpleasant. But what's fascinating is that within pages, she is, like, steeped in this world with, like, a bunch of prostitutes who work in Derek's club. Right. um, But don't work – he doesn't take money for – like, they keep all their money and he just is their security detail. Um, And they all have, like – Lisa's made sure that each one of them has, like, a really clear – Personality, like they have personalities. Mm-hmm. Um, I would argue, like there are two additional characters in this book, and one of them is Tabitha, the sort of lead prostitute here. Yeah. Um, and so what we start to see is Sarah kind of coming out of Greenwood Corners, her tiny little town, like, and yeah. her with her puritanical way of looking at the world, and starting to see that life is complicated. That women have bodily autonomy and that sex isn't all isn't shameful. I think what's even more interesting, though, is this she is well on her way. She's already well down the path of this journey. Matilda sure. is a book she has already written. That is research she has already done. Right, but we don't know if Matilda's alive or dead at the end of the book. And what's fascinating is she gets to the casino and all the prostitutes are like, Matilda's of course alive. I heard that she's living. We saw her on Bond Street. Yeah, I heard I saw her shopping on Bond Street once or I have a friend who says she's living with a prince in Italy or I have a such and such who like knows this about her. And in every one, Matilda has had a full happily ever after where like her her life as a prostitute has that has evolved into this like world where she is now married and happy and living well. And Sarah, I think like ultimately comes to the realization in that moment that like in those moments that Matilda, like, that that these women are connected to Matilda in a really powerful way, in a way that she is not. Like, she didn't see it. To me, this is a really clever commentary also on, like, romance in general. Mm. I don't think there's anyone in the book that she ever meets, even later on when she meets, like, some of the more, like, the lords or whatever, who think Matilda has come to a, a no good end. If she had written the book with a happily ever after, she would have been accused of, like, soft-selling it, Mm. of it not being realistic. If she had written a morality tale where Matilda gets punished at the end, then she gets, like, sort of becomes a scold. So the fact that Sarah is smart enough to, like, leave it ambiguous, to let people make that happy ending for themselves, I think, to me, is also one of the reasons I love this as a romance, is I think it's a... A meta commentary on romance itself. Yes. And women writers. Yes. Because Sarah is not Sarah as writing. The author of Matilda is not Sarah Fielding. It's S.J. Fielding, which we've seen a thousand times. J.K. Rowling, J.D. Robb, J.R. Ward. Like, initials become important to the text, to the authorship, if we need to convince men that it's a worthy read. I mean, like, at no point is this said in the text, but, like, it's clear that's what Lisa's doing here. Didn't you read the article? Oh, my God. It was going around, I feel like, again last week, though, about male writers who write romance 
under pseudonyms or maybe no no I, I'm lying it's not writing romance it's writing mysteries there are male writers who write mystery under initials to essentially hide that they're men and mm. and essentially sell themselves as a with a female persona as a writer and it's like as an article just like made my blood boil because it feels really different to hoodwink the patriarchy as a woman versus right. to have a man take advantage of the fact that women writers are ascendant yeah. feels really different to sure. me. I mean, without J.K. Rowling, that would not be a trick. Exactly. Yeah, that sucks. And if you're a man listening to this podcast doing that, you're the worst. <laughs> um, like at the end, like the club burns down and Derek decides not to reopen it. Yeah, interesting. And never once does Sarah say like, but what about... My prostitute friends. What about the girls? Like, they're just, like, that's, like, let go. Yeah. I mean, it is lost. It's lost. And I, I mean, I don't love it, but it's lost. I mean, like, the end of this book is really interesting because there is this sort of moment where, because the casino does not get rebuilt. And it's fascinating because ultimately readers of Lisa know that there will be a second casino that comes to pass here. Ivo Jenner, the villain, the, you know, halfway villain of this play, of this particular book, still has his casino, and it will become integral to Devil in Winter. So Lisa doesn't leave casinos behind. No. Um, though in this case, like Derek does, and it's worthy, it's worth us sort of coming back around to it maybe after, like after we've had some of these other conversations, because maybe we'll have more thoughts about why that is. I actually don't think it's complicated. Derek's, the whole entire framing of Derek as a character is that because he grew up with nothing, he always wanted more. He wants more, and now he doesn't and need more. He, he doesn't need everything. more anymore. She's like, everything. Yeah. Except, of course, he does, because he needs to still be rich. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he's doing, you know, he's like building hospitals with his money now. Sure. Like that, the the needing more, the having to impress people, the having to be in front of people, right? Like he, be, I mean, it's literally, we talked about like in that alpha, like last week, he is so, he is such a new man that he is the only father in all of London who carries his baby around and like notices all of her. I mean, sure. He is a different man. Th- different things are filling him up now. And He's and amazing. he has a family for the first time. I know. I, I know. So much. Derek Craven. He didn't have a name when he was born. He didn't know. He didn't know. He had to name himself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, in the immortal words of Aaron and Clayton from Learning the Tropes, Derek Craven is king. <laughs> God, yes, he is. Okay, but let's get into it, right? Because, oh, I do want to say one other thing about sex, and then we can move on. Sarah, at some point, and this is a really interesting choice authorially, right? So about halfway through this book, Derek sends Sarah away. And about, what, eight months pass? A while passes. Um, I don't think it's that long, is it? I thought it was more like eight weeks, but maybe I'm wrong. Oh, I don't know. I thought it was months, but we'll, I mean, we'll, we'll repair sure. it in show notes. But the, okay. so, um, and Sarah returns to, so what has happened is she has spent the first half of the book in London lurking, like skulking around in this casino, periodically making out with Derek Craven, falling like for the whole life. And like what, what initially becomes sort of just like fascinating research is now like something that she's really connected to and she feels yeah. deeply connected to. She really loves the factotum. She loves all the prostitutes. Like there's just this real sense of like her being a part of this community in a way that she's never felt part of a community. Because in Greenwood Corners, her tiny little town north, she yeah. has these aging parents and like this this dude who is basically moon. This is Moonstruck reference number one, who's basically like the Danny Aiello character in Moonstruck <laughs> with the the what the mom who is not in Sicily but is like living next door or living down the street from Sarah, who's like, I might die. You can't get married. <laughs> like I mean, it's very ridiculous right but like clearly an archetype we've seen it in other like we've seen it in moonstruck so it must be true um so she goes back to greenwood corners having kissed Derek craven having had this kind of 
they make out. They yeah. almost have sex. They do. Well, there's like a, he can't control himself and then he pulls himself off or like a wild animal and it's delicious. Worthy, like knocks on the door and right, like Ivo Jenner has been seen in the club and yeah. it's like total coitus interruptus, literally. And Derek is like, fine. And then Ivo abducts, basically kind of is like, hey, you should come to my casino instead. I'll let you see whatever you want. And Sarah's like, okay. Yeah, like, <laughs> let's get the fuck out of here. And then they get caught in a riot, which is such a Lisa Kleypas kind of thing to do. Like, there's like this historical, this very sort of historical feeling, like oh, yeah. accurate feeling riot. And they get separated in the riot. And then Derek Craven comes in like an avenging superhero to save her. And it's fucking delicious and then he sends her home so, you know what else i wanted okay i'm sorry i keep interrupting I know, but it's fine interrupting me but it's fine Derek craven is king go on Derek craven is king here's what i want to say um about him saving her the thing that is amazing about Derek is everyone else thinks she is this shy retiring flower who just happens to be strong-willed about her writing mm -hmm. and time and time again he says to people like you are out of your minds don't you see what a danger she is don't you see how reckless she is don't you understand what she is really capable of and right. there's this sense that he can like see things about her that that are there right because but that she's no one else can see of yeah. smashing the patriarchy yeah. And he knows it. <laughs> yes. And I love it. Um, That's why it's all so delicious. Uh, it's fucking awesome. So he saves her and then he's like, I cannot keep you safe from myself at this yeah. point. Like, there's a moment where he's like, I just want to shake you until you fall over. Yeah. Like, you're going to get yourself killed. <laughs> and it's the first glimpse that the reader has of, like, him Really, honestly, like, not being able to control himself yeah. because of his feelings for her. His feelings for her are so um, impossible to understand because yeah. Alpha, right, that he's, like, overwhelmed by them and, like, can't deal. So he sends her back to Greenwood Corners. And she goes. And she gets there and she has – what's his name? Percy? Perry. Perry. She has Perry, her milk Her fiancé – whiny baby fiance who's like in his mother's apron strings and she goes to him and she's like hey i want you to kiss me yeah like i want you like do you love me he's like yep <laughs> she's like do you want to get married he's like totally sure, but my I mom guess. yeah my mom and she's like okay well if that's true then i'd really appreciate it if you would kiss me or like can yeah. we have some kind of relationship here? Like, people who are in love want to touch. Yeah. They want to touch butts. And um, he's like, oh, God, no. What happened to you? Yeah. Like, why are you so shameful? Mm -hmm. Why are you, what so you do wanting? in the city? What have you done? Yeah. What has the city done to you? And this, like, I mean, it's not even a metaphor. It's so obvious. But, like, this sense of, like, pure slut shaming that goes on here, this, like, deep-rooted, like, puritanical morality play that it plays out in Greenwood Corners with Percy, although Perry. fascinating – or sorry, whatever. I don't care. It should be – it could be either of those. <laughs> um, this kind of shaming is so – is an echo of that initial chapter shaming of Matilda. Like, sure. it's like Matilda had access to this world and Sarah didn't. And she didn't understand, like, what this world could be. And now Sarah has had, had access to this world and understands, like, right. how, brought, how sex and love and, and passion – and parody can expand your life and, like, expand, expand your world. And now she's back in Greenwood Corners and claustrophobic. Oh, God, in and every now way. Yeah. Perry is like, who the fuck are you, you slut? Interestingly, her mom is also in Greenwood Corners and is like, hey, so looks like you've been doing something with someone. You want to talk about it? <laughs> She's a cool mom. She's a, her parents are very cool. I mean, I think one of the things that's also really fascinating about, you know, it, I guess I would say this. I often, when I read Dreaming of You, I don't reread the whole thing. And I tend to actually skip 
these Greenwood Corners chapters Mm -hmm. because I'm all about Derek and Sarah being together and I'm not getting that there. And the first time, I mean, I think even there was sort of a time where I was like, what's this even doing here? But I will tell you, I think it is doing so much there. doing an immense amount of character work for Sarah. Yeah, absolutely. And not just like who she is and where she's from and what she's capable of. But also, I would say there's this sense of, um, you know, you used the word archetypes earlier. Like, everyone in this book, in a way, is an archetype. And so, you know, we talked about, like, Perry and his mother, and then, like, her sort of aging elderly parents who just want her to, you know, like, we're not going to be around forever, so we have to raise you to think for yourself. And that Sarah both, like, loves that and, like, takes it to heart, like, really takes charge with it, but also that she feels really profoundly this sense of now, but now they've made me different. I can't be happy in Greenwood Corners anymore. And I don't think the book works unless she realizes that before she, like, runs into Derek again. Because I think in the book we see her in some ways idealizing yeah, I'm going to go back and this is my lot in life. This is like my path. And it's not until she gets back and realizes this isn't my path anymore. She, she needed that, I think. And I think we as readers need to see her realize that. Jen, we have to see her do this because she's not the most likable character at the beginning of this book. Yeah. She's not complex. She's, Derek's the star of the beginning of the book. Yeah. She's sort of stupid. Like, she's, she's like, a a little bit too stupid to live in those beginning scenes. And she doesn't have a kind of, you don't see nuance in Sarah. Like, she has a very clear-minded sense of right and wrong, Mm -hmm. of moral and immoral, of, like, what she wants to try and do with her characters and do with her books, and the way she thinks the world should work. And Derek is sort of the voice of the reader in this moment, where he's like, you don't have any idea yeah. Of what the world is like, of how the world should work. Um, and interestingly, the way that the the turning point in Greenwood Corners, aside from being slut shamed by her idiot fiance, is when Tabitha comes. And here we are, you guys. I really want to talk about this. Go for it. I think there's a lot of layers. And it's funny because the things that I find interesting about this scene are not the things that And that's okay. Like, everyone can find different things interesting. So she has befriended Tabitha. And, you know, we don't really get it. We get a sense of them being, like, kind of bawdy and fun. They've got a really, like, great sense of humor. They're really, like, happy women who, um, like, like being with each other and like being with Sarah and talking about their lives, right? So Tabitha, when she comes to stop by, she's essentially traveling to visit her family. It is I love that, by the way. She's a prostitute. She's not Lisa does not hesitate. Like she's like some some people choose sex work, and that's a valid choice. Tabitha has a whole family. She's not like an orphan. So she, and and doesn't she even say like they don't really know what she does? I yeah, can't. which makes sense. I mean, I have I have a friend who's a dominatrix. Nobody knows that that's what she does. Like sure, right? Yeah. And that's shitty that that's how life is. But, like, congratulations, that's how life is, everyone. Like, what I find fascinating about this scene is she comes and it's, to me, it was this, like, very finely tuned scene where both people have an agenda. Mm. Right? But it's, like, how are we going to, like, we, like, are, and this is, like, the real waltz of the book, right? Like, how are we going to enter into this conversation with each, other, with each other and, like, tell each other what we want and find out what we need from the other one? Yeah, and Lisa even s- articulates that. Like, on the page, she says, like, Sarah, we're, in, we're deep in Sarah's POV, mm-hmm. and Sarah's like, I, um, she wants to ask about Derek. She asks about yes. every other person in the class. Yes. Yes. And then she wants to ask, but she doesn't ask about Derek. And then she gets the sense from Tabitha that Tabitha is sort of like doing a dance to get her to ask. And then she says, you know, um, you know, how how is he? Right. I think is what she says. How is he? 
And um, what Tabitha says is she tells the story about, like, first of all, she sort of, like, soft sells it. He's furious. He doesn't really eat. He he needed, he asked for the big knife. That's <laughs> Moonstruck yes. reference number two. Chrissy. Bring me the big knife. <laughs> yes. That, like, actually says it. Oh, my God. He's, like, cursing out, like, the fancy French chef. And Sarah's, like, okay, but why did you come here? This mood has nothing to do with me. And and Tabitha's, like, it has everything to do with you. And no one knows this better than me. Because it's well established at this point in the text that they actually are very similar in their coloring and in, the like, you know, their, the, their size. And what she then tells Sarah is... Um, Essentially, that Derek came to her one night and swore, made Tabitha swear she would never tell anybody. And he holds her all night and says, let me hold you, Sarah. I need you, Sarah. And 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 she stops and she looks at Sarah and says, he was pretending to be with you, but he was with me. I, I, you guys, I cannot control myself. I love this scene so much. You want to talk about taking the fucking finger? Oh, shit, This is Cressley levels of taking the finger. And what is really fascinating is, she says, like, right, he was gentle and sweet about it. And in the morning, he left without a word, but he still had that terrible look in his eyes. Now, I think what's great about this scene is, it's, um, I guess it could be ambiguous, right? Like, there are days I'm like, he definitely fucked her. And then there are days I'm like, I don't know, did he fuck her? (laughs) (laughs) Man, oh, man, Twitter does not like this scene. No, and you know what? That's fine. I don't care. Here's what I think is fascinating about this scene. is not that Derek did this, but that Tabitha came to her to tell her that. That is what is fascinating to me about this scene. Yeah. It's remarkable. And also the moment. So there's this back and forth. It's beautifully done with Sarah thinking like both I shouldn't be t- like if he told you not to tell don't tell me but and of course me. because we're I mean like we're all please obviously uh, if you are the type of person who could walk away from this conversation you are a far <laughs> better person than either Jen or me <laughs> I mean like we all want to know of course I mean here's my thing I absolutely think he did yeah. um like, there is no question in my mind that he did, and I'm fine with it. Yeah. Like, because it's purely – it suits the character so well. And here's what I will say. I got permission to tell the story. Okay. I had dinner with Lisa Kleypas this weekend. Of course I was like, Sarah, you have to ask her. And I did. I asked her. And she said, because she's a genius – <laughs> it doesn't matter if he did or he didn't, because no matter how he did it, all yeah. that the only thing that was important about that scene was the softness of it. Like, yeah, if if they had sex or they didn't, the softness and the gentleness and the pretending that they the tenderness was the only thing that mattered. Like if there had been sex, it just would have been an act. And I think, and she actually said she doesn't know that she goes back and forth, and that she's like, more like, yeah, it de- like some days yes, and some days no. But I thought that was such an interesting. Of course, it's true. Like the betrayal, if there is any betrayal, is emotional there. Oh yeah, but there's no in my mind. It's not. There's no betrayal because in his mind, he's dirt under Sarah's feet. And they have no chance. Like, he will never see her again. Well, and that's it. Tabitha says, right? He thinks you're too good for him. You're as fine as an angel. He never thinks he's going to see her again. No. Ever. This is like a moment of, this is like a, a to me, I read it. It's like a, a boy with his teddy bear, right? It's yeah. just this comfort object. Derek Craven, in his mind, believes that for the rest of time, he's going to have to find prostitutes that look like Sarah. Yeah. So, like, I think that this is the thing. I think it's really unfair to write the whole book off for this moment and basically say, like, Derek Craven is canceled because he slept with a prostitute. Like, he doesn't know that there's ever going to be a possibility of him ever seeing her again. He has no intention of ever seeing her again. It's over. It's over. She is gone and married. 
right? He thinks she's probably married by now. Go back to your fiance. So, I mean, for him, it's just like, this is going to be my life now. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I don't even... Yes, I mean, it's it's like this sad, like really powerful kind of moment, this glimpse into him, his eyes. But I mean, I'm I'm thinking a lot about this. Like, imagine your friend comes to you. I mean, because Tabitha and Sarah are friends and tells you this story about this man who is desperately in love with you came to me pretending I was you. She does not see anything in this story that implicates him or her. She's like, this is how fucked up he is. Over you. You got to come back. You got to come back. You got to come back. This shit is, he can't live like this, right? We're going to put a pin in this uh, and bring it back around when we talk about A Kingdom of Dreams. Because McNaught does the same thing in A Kingdom of Dreams, but in a different way. Yeah. And so, and I think it's a really powerful yeah, you're right. It's a powerful moment. I mean, this is the, this is the best use. This is the best romance novels use secondary characters to do this kind of like deeply heavy emotional lifting. Right. There was no, there is no scenario. It's also really deftly done, handled with p- point of view. We don't see Derek do it. We don't know what's in his head. No. We, Sarah doesn't see Derek do it. So there's no sense of betrayal. Right. And interestingly, Lisa doesn't, there's no betrayal on the page. Sarah doesn't feel betrayed. Instead, Sarah's like, oh God, this is terrible. And then Lily invites, thank God for meddling friends. Lily invites her to a country house party. Well, but she does leave Perry. Yeah. Well, what Sarah says that's really interesting after is like, I'm betrothed to another man. I mean, I think she feels like what he did is equal to what I'm doing. I'm going to, I'm going to be with another man. He's with this other woman. And so it's really interesting. Tabitha is disappointed. The disappointment in this scene is Tabitha's disappointment in Sarah. Yeah. Cause she's like nut up. Fielding, get yourself back to London and live a life worthy of this man's love. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, ah, same, same, Tabitha. In many ways, the other thing I thought about this book a lot, and I think you and I can talk about this now, is, you know, this book is now, what, 25 years old. Mm. The, the pacing feels different, and some of the way I want you to talk about head hopping feels different. Yeah. And and what I mean by pacing is it is not common. It is months, by the way. Okay. Yeah. It is not common. Is it eight months or just a couple months? It's well, it's through the summer. It's she leaves like midsummer and it's through Christmas. Oh, it's not till Christmas. Okay. Um yeah. she, you know, here's my thing is she the pacing of this is so interesting to me because they're together. It's like really intense, really fast in terms of their feelings. But there's I mean, there's this one scene at the ball. <gasps> we gotta talk about the masquerade. And then she like departs, she's gone. There's a part in the middle where we're really just with Sarah. And we don't get much of Derek at all until no. she decides to go to go to like the house party. Then yeah. he like enters back into the picture. Right. And that kind of pacing is is frankly unusual now. It's I it, absolutely. I mean, the rule now is like the hero and heroine can't not be on the page together, right? So like you have to figure out how to get them onto the page as quickly as possible and then like right. keep them there. Right. Um and I think, you know, partially that's timing. The look, this book I mean, I'm with you. Like, I don't think I've read this book all the way through in a while. But, like, I read parts of this book all the time. Every couple of months. But one of the things that I noticed because I was reading beginning to end is that it has that early 90s head hopping going on in it. Now, for those of you who are Lisa Kleypas fans or have, you know, are interested in becoming Lisa Kleypas fans, the next time you read one of Lisa's sex scenes... Um, pay close attention to this because Lisa is incredibly – one of the hallmarks of Lisa's romances is that in sex, when she's writing sex, point of view goes – gets closer and closer and closer and closer together from the hero yeah. and the heroine's point of view until the point where you are in close third perspective – for both of them, and you've sort of lost the abel- ability to see who is thinking what when. Yeah. And this is why her sex scenes work. They are technically 
so perfect because as a writer, like from a craft perspective, that is incredibly difficult to do and yeah. not throw the reader out of the scene because you're literally hopping from POV to POV within sentences. And now that I've said this to you, the next time you read a Kleypas sex scene, you will notice that this is what is happening. And it's mag- it's magnificent to like unpack from a writer perspective. Um that said, this book head hops a ton. Sentence by sentence, even. Not, I mean, it is common now. We talked about this. Paragraph to paragraph. Chapter yeah. by chapter, right? Like you have a chapter from the hero's point of view and then a chapter from the heroine's maybe, right? Cressley's books, my books, most modern romance novels uh, written in third person do this thing where you exchange the POV transfers back and forth so it's Mm -hmm. one scene from the hero's perspective the next scene from the heroine's perspective back and forth and back and forth like a tennis match sometimes it's like two chapters if you need to stick with the heroine for a longer period of time or the hero for a longer period of time but generally it's sort of back and forth and back and forth when books are doing a kind of different kind of thing uh there's a there's an ann mallory book where you're in the um the hero's point of view for like seven or eight of the first chapters. And then you switch to the, you sort of notice, like you would notice as regular romance readers, when the POV is doing something different than what's common, which now in 2019 is that back and forth, the volley. Even in first person. And you know, what was interesting is um, I read that book all together by Brill Harper, which is about a, a menage, a threesome. And the first third is from the heroine's point of view. And then the middle third is from one of the men. And then the last third is from the other. Mm. And it was fascinating because it's not at all what I expected. Mm. Well, you know that was released in three parts, right? Do oh, you know I that? don't think I knew that. Okay, well, that made that makes sense then. Okay. So, but I think, like, the point here is that we are not used anymore to the idea of, like, head hopping happening, like, within paragraphs, the person who is most famous for this is Nora Roberts, who continues to head hop. She's a she's a, she head hops within paragraphs, within pages. And the J.R. Ward. I mean, I don't know. I would have to go back because I would have told you Lisa Kleypas didn't head hop. But it's 1994 and Dreaming of You is head hoppy. Like uh, we go from Derek to Sarah to Derek to Sarah. And the way that I mean, the best way to explain this for those of you who aren't writers is um um, you know the point of view the, of, your, of the character you're in when you see their feelings on the page. You know, like, yeah. she was hot with embarrassment and said, blah, right? right. He looked Obviously, across the carriage and saw her and thought X or whatever, right? right? Because, the he- like, if she's hot with embarrassment, the hero doesn't know she's hot with embarrassment. The hero might say um, he noticed that she was flushed and wondered right. if she was embarrassed, right? But, like, right. there's... It, the the language is such that like if if she if the care if the if the omniscient narrator is saying how the character is feeling then you're in that character's point of view Clo- this is called close third point of view it actually was basically invented by Jane Austen we'll put links in show notes about it if you want to learn all the nerdy stuff about this um, but it's like the cornerstone of romance novels because. That's how we get you emotionally. We dig real deep and, like, tell you how characters are feeling. Um, What Lisa does is there's sort of a Derek sees Sarah and thinks X. And then next paragraph, Mm -hmm. Sarah replies thinking Y. And Mm -hmm. it's a really interesting – and doesn't impact the book at all for me. Like, the reader – it doesn't impact the the reading experience at all in the way that – Interestingly, it can impact my reader experience now in 2019. And I don't know if that's because of Lisa's skill. Probably yes. Or if I'm just like willing to dis- dispense it because I've read this book 10,000 times. So many times. Yeah. I, it's interesting. I But I'm interested to see the other books that we've picked for the season and if they do the same thing and how yeah. that reads to me. Yeah. I feel like it's what's especially interesting about it to me is – you know, the sense of like pacing again. And we talked about point of view. Um, I read a read a book where that was like a couple of chapters from the hero's point of view or, you know, the heroine's point of view. And then every once in a while, a hero point of view chapter or like scene. And it felt like, um, you know, it's it's very difficult, I think, to carry off full development of the non point of view character mm. without 
spending some time in their head. Like that's like the easiest way to do it. And so it's really interesting because in a book like that, where it feels uneven, Mm -hmm. it feels like the author is, I mean, I, maybe this is judgmental and I'm fine with it. It, the, the book does not feel as accomplished. Right. But in this case, it just feels like it's such a different narration style because it was a different time that I don't, I don't think she's doing it now because I just started reading Hello Stranger and it doesn't, it's not doing this. No, I mean, I certainly didn't notice when I read Devil, uh, Devil's Daughter, which is the last book I read by her. Um, so I, we're, we're at an hour now. So I want to, I want to make sure that we hit the rest of our things. I want (laughs) to talk about Joyce. I mean, we can't, the elephant in the room. Um, Joyce. Joyce is a problem. (sighs) But I would also argue Perry's mom is a problem. I don't care so much about Perry's mom being a problem. And I'll tell you why. Because I actually think that archetype, that sort of mother of sons who refuses to, like, let her son go is a thing that happens in the world. Sure. there's a reason why... uh, Am I the asshole on Reddit? <laughs> it's uh, filled with like sure, like mother in law, mother in law, yeah, posts, right. So I care less about that. I actually also think like she's not necess- like she's not important. Like that conversation, like she's a tool for Perry to be t- like a moral to like take moral high ground that is stupid, right? Well, and it's a tool to keep Sarah like it's. The anchor that pulls her back to Greenwood Corners, but then also once she, like, cuts Perry loose, then she can just float away. Like, right? Like, she doesn't really need to stay there. Yeah. So I think it's it's just but a Joyce, mechanism. I mean, we talked yeah. about this a lot during our bodily autonomy episode, um, which we will link to uh, from last season. But we talked about how the evil other woman yeah. um, is not a great plot. And... We are going to see a lot of either evil other women this season. Yeah, because um, it's very, yeah. Because it was a real cheap shot in the early days of this of this genre to, like, say, like, okay, well, we I need a villain. I need yeah. the villain to be over the top, right? Because remember, all these books are a little bit bananas. And I need the villain to be over the top. And, like, my choices are all the archetypes of evil men or yeah. all the archetypes of evil women An evil other woman is one of those things. So when we start the book, Derek has a mistress, Mm -hmm. um, an aristocratic mistress who's wild about him. And he's utterly bored by her. And he ends their relationship. And and she's mad, big mad, big mad enough that she sends two guys out into the darkness to attack him on the street. And that's how he meets Sarah. Right. She shoots one of them thinking that they're going to kill him. Uh-huh. She and the whole point was to like knife him in the face to make to scar him so right. that he would like never forget her. She's real bananas. Like yeah. she's real uh, over the top bonkers. And it's like cartoonishly evil in the way that now makes me sort of flinch, right? Like she likes kinky sex. So yeah. she's a bad girl, right? Um, she's had abortions. She has. I didn't think that was as damning as the kinky I sex stuff. I don't right? think that that's yeah. damning. I think, um, and I say that because I've literally seen Lisa tackle abortion in multiple ways over ev- like over the course of her career, and it has never been shaming. Yeah. So I just like I give Lisa the benefit of the doubt here. Like she's how I learned that people drank like herb tea to right. abort. Right fetuses yeah. and she you know there's the whole devil in winter thing where he explains like prim- primitive iud's yeah um so like i just don't i just don't think it's shaming um but she does she likes kinky sex and she is evil and she's like stunningly beautiful and she's a femme fatale and mm-hmm. then ultimately she like kidnaps sarah and like takes her away and it's all kind of yeah it's bad. It's ju- it does not age well. No, I think the part that's really fascinating to me. Yeah, trigger warning. Uh-huh. She rapes. She rapes Derek at one point. I think the part that's like fascinating to me in is that she does also she is given this 
pretty tragic backstory, which is she is married to a much older and terrible man when she's only like 15. Mm Mm-hmm. And that he is the one who, it's almost like Dangerous Liaisons. I mm-hmm. wonder when that book came out. It's like, like, well, I, or that ancient. book, obviously. No, I mean the I mean, movie. I'm like, as, as soon as I said, I was like, that's stupid, everybody. I knew that the book's been around a long time. But Definitely in the that 80s. That late 80s movie, right, was like a huge deal. And it almost feels to me like. The Glenn Close character. Almost, but more like, you know, he ruins that young girl, the Uma Thurman (gasps) character. Oh, yeah. What would she be like in 10 or 15 or 20 years? She's going to turn into Glenn Close, right? Because of the way these men, this man has just, has defiled her for fun, right? Absolutely. I'm with you on that. It doesn't quite get there. Like, you're not, I mean, I think you're right. I think Lisa is trying to explain, to like give an origin story to this villain, but it's just hard. I mean, it's 25 years old and we don't think about women this way anymore. No. And here's the part that I actually think is the part that to me is the most damning. I mean, all this stuff is really terrible, but at the end, the way the Joyce problem gets fixed is they go to her husband Mm-hmm. And, and he, he punishes her. and he punishes her, and she is terrified, and she is he's gonna like lock her up in Scotland or some shit like that. And mm-hmm. I found that punishment, that sense that like we know what turned her into her, and now we're going to like hand her back to him for for yeah. like right. That's the part that to me feels even worse is. It's not just that she's this like cartoonishly villain villainous woman. It's the way that she gets punished is to be back in the hands of this man and she will never see society again. And I find that actually almost of all of it to be kind of the worst, to be honest with you, because yeah, no one else in the book gets treated that way. I don't know. Sure. But like, on the other hand, what are the other options for Joyce who has tried to kill Derek, tried to kill Sarah? Like, she's terrible. So, like, institutionalizing her, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, the other options aren't exactly better. Sure, kill her, like, I guess, right? I mean, I, yeah, it's just, it's hard because I do think, like, this is the one piece of this book that, one, doesn't age well, and two, feels like, but at the same time, feels really, like, a brand of the time. Oh, like, God, it's, yes. This is a book, this is one of those moments we said from the beginning of this, you know, when we introduced this this season, we said, like, we're going to have to think about the time. And, like, in the late 80s and early 90s, like, this character existed in romance. Like, she wasn't questioned by readers. She wasn't questioned. I mean, no. lar- I'm sure she was. But, like, she wasn't largely questioned by readers. She wasn't largely questioned by publishing. Like, she just sort of existed. And I might add, she still exists in media today oh without a doubt like you know when i evil comic book villain who's a woman has this kind of you know dna so like congratulations romance we cleared that we cleared that hurdle faster than most places yeah you know the thing that i actually think about a lot like going back to bill clinton is at the beginning of the clinton like sort of scandals. There's one woman in particular and I, it's not Monica Lewinsky and I'm trying to think of the name of the woman. I can see her face. Long brown hair. Yes. Yes. Paula. Paula. Was that her? Okay, hold on. I'm going to look it up. And Paula Jones, right? Yeah. Um, And she, I wasn't, you know what? No, wasn't there a woman who was like a sex worker? Or someone who was, okay, anyway, here's what I was thinking. Maybe this is like, I'm not sure this is like the best thing, but whatever. But I remember, oh, Jennifer Flowers is who I'm thinking of. Oh, yeah, Jennifer Flowers, sure. Right? And what I'm thinking of is she was like a model and she had this sexual encounter. And there was this sense that she actually definitely got like shamed, right? Like just all these women accusing Bill Clinton of being no good at some point were no good themselves. Um, Well, Stormy Daniels. Hi. I know, but the thing about Stormy Daniels is Stormy Daniels gets on Twitter and routinely kicks people's asses. She's a hero now. Right. And that, to me, is, like, the big difference about, like, I, when I think about that character in, like, these presidential yeah. scandals, right, these cast-offs of powerful, powerful men, I yeah. feel like that 
that continuum somehow feels like the one where we like, you know, Stormy Daniels is now like someone I greatly admire. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Like she just calls that shit out all the time. Yeah. I want to talk about talismans. Okay. Well, you know what? I think something else. Well, I think it fits in nicely actually with the masquerade thing, because Mm. what I want to talk about is one of my favorite tropes. (laughs) in a historical is it's a masquerade ball. I have some little, it's like superhero shit, right? I have a little iPad. I've written this like 12,000 times. I've got something. <laughs> you can't tell who I am. Covering my <laughs> And now no one recognizes me except, except of course, like, right. So, and I think a lot about this because it's so ridiculous on its face. I'm pretty sure if I just put a mask on and walked around, everyone I know would be like, Hey Jen. <laughs> right. <laughs> So what and and meanwhile though in a book where it goes on too long where people don't recognize each other I'm like this is bullshit too but there is these like magical golden hours yeah where it's, you get to be someone else yeah it's uh Elizabeth Hoyt's The Raven Prince does this perfectly for me where she's she's masqueraded at the brothel with him um yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's magnificent. The mask, we should do a whole interstitial on masks because, oh, like, yeah. there's so much to say about them. It's but, amazing. yeah, this is perfect. This is actually one. So there are two versions of this. One is uh, I'm masked and you don't recognize me. The yeah. other is I'm masked and you're the only one who recognizes me. Oh, God. And that's the one I really like. Where, yeah. you're, where, like, he comes to her and he's like, you look fucking ridiculous. Everyone here is going to recognize you. Yes. Um, which is what my heroes usually do. But in this particular case, yeah. he doesn't recognize her, except he is deeply drawn to her. And he is like, who is that chick? I have to have her. Worthy is like, you got to get her out of here. Craven's going to freak out. <laughs> if they get, right? I mean, but this is a dangerous moment. everybody thinks she's moment. Matilda. Everyone thinks she's Matilda. And I think the thing that is amazing about that is this is the first time everyone can see what Derek saw, which is that she, there's something dangerous about her, Mm -hmm. right? That there's something profoundly interesting and magnetic about her, but it's hidden behind her like mousy, writerly, walking Mm -hmm. around her spectacles, right? Exterior. And this is the only time that like everyone is fucking like, yeah, that's that's Matilda, right? And, I mean, and that's the part. This shit is magic. Yep. Magic. So it's I think perfect. It's perfect. The spectacles, to me, are similar because it's all about how we see people. Of course. And he mm. takes them from her and suddenly oh, she's able to see his world in a clear way. Like, she is no longer blinded. Like, she's no longer shielded um, from the world. And so she sees the worst and the best of it all at once. And so he steals her spectacles. So it's it's laid out so beautifully where at the beginning he's like, you're always like she's writing in his office and he's like, why are you in my space? And then he sees her spectacles on the table and he's like, how many of these do you have? And she's like, two pairs. And he's like, you're leaving. You leave them everywhere. Like I find them everywhere. All Um, over. And it's such a, like, I had this moment where I was like, it's both, like, a symbol of him being consumed by her, right? Like, I'm sure she's not leaving them everywhere. She only has two pairs. She doesn't live in this casino. But also this sense of, like, real domesticity. Like, how often does Eric say to me, like, God damn it, Sarah, like, everywhere I look, Uh, there's lip balm, right? Like, and, and it's just, it's so domestic. And then he steals her glasses. And he keeps them in her pocket. The first act of pocket. outright thievery he had committed in uh, years. Like stealing her heart. <laughs> oh. Oh, it's magnificent. And then he's got them. And then you sort, but in classic Kleypas form. Yeah. He steals them. And then you forget. You forget. She leaves it on, the, she leaves the gun on the table for yes. an eternity until you have forgotten that he has them and then she and then Sarah discovers them and it's like dawn when it happens in the book it's so magnificent because here you are again and he's suddenly seeing her 
in like a way and mm-hmm. she's seeing him in this new way. Oh yeah. And, and the she's metaphors like, are magnificent. And she does Lisa Claypis does spectacles better than uh F. Scott Fitzgerald. Yes. Bam. <laughs> Shots fired. There, Fine. put it on a t shirt. <laughs> That's right. I mean, hello, we're gonna get Kelly to make a button with just spectacles. Derek Craven <laughs> would steal your fucking spectacles. You know, the thing though, too, about that moment when she like feels them and she's like, you know, what is it? What's hurting? Is it your heart? Right? Like she knows because he's carrying them right over his heart. No, oh, I love that. She's so <sighs> bold. Oh, God. She's so bold. Like, she's figured it out. She's like this. We haven't talked about the fact that she's, like, plus-sized and, like, dowdy. Oh, yeah. It doesn't matter. she's like, I I know that you love me. I know you love me. You magnificent beast of a man. Yeah. Well, and then. Derek Craven's a king. Oh, God. And you know what, though? Like, this is where I think. And this is where, like, the Joyce you know, he saves her. Joyce sends someone in to essentially rape her. It's a terrible scene. Oh, yeah. He saves her from this. He saved her from the riot earlier. He saves her from this now. And, you know, then there's like this, like these machinations where it's like somebody's got to marry her. She can't like be this way. And I, I will say I, um, it's fine. Like, obviously they're going to be together. And he says like delightful things like I'm never going to get in the way of your writing. I'm never going to, like, stop you from your projects, right? I love all that stuff. But I do wish that scene didn't exist in this book. You mean the Joyce sending? Yeah, that is the worst. For me, it's not Joyce's punishment. That's the worst scene in the book. When Joyce sends a man to torture Sarah. And, like, look, I mean, I don't know. We're better now. And Lisa's better. Like, Lisa's learned, like... It's 25 years old, and, like, I'm, I don't want to be an apologist. Like, this is not okay. Yeah. But, like, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater on this book. Like, there's so much magnificence here. Right. Um, and I want to also um, – I just want to give a shout-out. So Derek is a secondary character from the book that came before it called mm-hmm. Then Came You, which is about an actress and a Marquis. And like so. Lily yeah. is magnificent. Lily mm-hmm. comes. And so and actually Lisa told me this weekend that like basically like she had just invented Derek as a foil for the hero of Then Came You. And also competition like Derek kind of has this view in Then Came You. It's pretty cl- it's pretty it's hinted that Derek's in love with Lily. Right. Yeah. Right. But that like he he appreciates that he can never have her because he's not good enough. Right. Right. Sure. So and what Lisa said was like, you have freedom as a writer with secondary characters to build them in whatever image you want to build them in. Like, you don't have to sit down and say, I'm going to create a hero. You Just sit down and you create Derek Craven. Right. And then you set him, you know, you wind him up and you set him loose in the book. And then by the end, he's haunting you. And that's yeah. what she said. She said at the end of that book, he was haunting me. Like I had to write his book. And at that point, I just didn't, I knew I was going to have to convince my editor and everyone else that Derek was a hero. And what's remarkable about this is not only did Lisa convince us that this like cockney, drawled, crooked toothed, like dirty sure. ex prostitute hero was a worthy hero in a romance novel in 1994, she set the standard for working class heroes. She set the standard for a sort of this kind of dichotomy of relationships Mm -hmm. in a romance novel and arguably she wrote one of the most important texts in the genre you know we talked about this with Lothair and we talked about this with anti-heroes like there are ways in which he is broken and like remade as a man worthy of Sarah's love but he is also still Derek Craven and at the end of the book and he gets his hands on Ivo Jenner and he's like, I'm going to fucking murder you when they have to stop him. Like, yeah, because Jenner comes. So when the when the casino burns, so Jenner and he have had this rivalry and it's been not great. Like at the beginning, he thinks Jenner's the reason why he's being attacked in the street. Like it's clearly not like, hey, we like we're frenemies. It's mm-hmm. like a rivalry. Mm-hmm. And um, 
you know, when the fire happens and the casino burns and he's standing in the rubble. I mean, it's a magnificent scene. Like, yeah, the, we have to talk about in, the ending, right? Yeah. Empirically, this scene is outrageously good where like the he's standing like in the rubble of the casino and he realizes like every for a guy who's only ever wanted more, who's wanted what? a palace, who built rooms yeah. in this casino that like rival Versailles. He's like, none of it matters because I've lost her. And nobody knows what to do or say because no. they've never seen him moved. He's never Not had like this. emotion, right? Pure emotion. So Jenner turns up at the um, at the fire and you see Jenner keenly aware of what has happened and the impact. Like Jenner, who is cut from the same cloth as Derek, right? Also yeah. grew up poor, also from the streets, knows instantly – he has to apologize. He has to be clear that he had nothing to do with this because Derek Craven is going to raise London in fury. <laughs> yes. And Jenner knows, like, he can't. This in, in the, it's like uh, there's this magnificent moment of like honor among thieves where Jenner's like, I would never. I vote Jenner would never. <laughs> There's a lot of shit he'd do, but he would not do yeah, this. Yeah, he would never. I would never take this from you. I would never do this to you. In fact, I'm going to prove it because my guys saw whatever. And that information could have been put in the hands of any other character. But Lisa puts it into yes. the voice of another enemy. Like, there is uh, there's something really powerful there. And then we see – that's where we start to see, like, gen- the seeds of the Jenner who will return in Devil in Winter. I mean, we talk about, like, knocking down a hero to, like, nothing. I mean, this is, to me, the roots of my need to see a hero. Like, like she, like, fucking dug out a hole and put him down in it. Mm-hmm. And so the fact that Jenner is the one who says, like, I saw her, it's like, how do you hope – when the news is being delivered by someone you hate. Mm, hmm Like, think about how powerful that is. This is also where we see, like, all of the ways in which he has changed. Because mm-hmm. Jenner never would have been able to say boo to him before, and he would have listened. And it speaks to his desperation. Yeah. But it, I think it also speaks to, like, how he is different. And to Kleypas' keen understanding of humanity. Oh, yeah. That we turn to hope when we have nothing else. Uh, we see it over and over again in the world. Like, you just do. You Like, when all is lost, you all you have left is hope. And ultimately, the, mag- the most magnificent piece of that is romance is the literature of hope. So, like, we too have hope alongside him, despite having seen him have nothing. Like, it's such a perfect book. It's such a perfect book. When they are, like, in, like, the literal, like, burning embers of the casino, and he sees her. Oh, I know. And he's just like, don't leave me. And he doesn't even know that she's a real deal. Ugh. Yeah. It's pretty perfect. I mean, it's it's not pretty. It fucking wrecks me, right? so good. And then I love, she's like, have you been drinking? And he's basically just, like... Holding her. Yeah. Yeah. And then he says, or he cries. He says, I love you. I know. Ugh. Kate Claiborne loves that part. Who doesn't? I know. He cries. He cries. Um, I think we did this justice. I hope so. I fucking love this book. Lisa, Lisa, if if you're listening to this, we we fucking love you. We, we love, love your you. Book. We love Derek Craven. Oh, come on the podcast and tell us all about it. <laughs> oh, um, and thank you for letting me tell those two stories uh, on the podcast. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, <sighs> tell us All what right. we're doing next, Sarah. Oh, next week we have an interstitial with Alyssa Cole. Yeah, super exciting. Which we recorded a long time ago, we before RWA, so back earlier this summer. It is the infamous Frog Podcast. It's going to be awesome. I'm super excited yeah. about it. Next week, interstitial. And then uh, we're gonna we're gonna go back in time to 1990, 
um, to when I was in the sixth grade. (laughs) (laughs) And and we are going to talk about Gentle Rogue, which is the book that made me and my best friend from childhood, Lindsay, best friends because I hid that book inside uh, my geography textbook in eighth grade. And I will tell you all about being in trouble about that, Um, which that story does not go the way you think it does, but I'll tell you all about (laughs) it. Anyway, it's Joanna Lindsay's Gentle Rogue, Georgina Anderson, and James Mallory, um, who everyone knows as Fabio. Sure. And uh, James Mallory is a massive, massive favorite in Romancelandia. Um, and we're going to get to it because he is a whole lot. Can I tell you something? Please. I mean, I'm sure I've read it. I have no memory of this book. No. <gasps> I mean, I'm oh sure gosh. I read it. I'm sure I've read it because, of course, I am. It's going to be a delight for you. I Also, you guys, I haven't reread Gentle Rogue in a while. So, as always, I mean, I feel like we're just going to have to put this as a PSA at the end of every episode. But, like, if it's wacky and super problematic, I'm sorry. Like, yeah. will I think you can trust Jen and I to really dig deep on it. I'm excited. Me too. Uh, this is Faded Mates, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for season two. We are super excited. We're going to do all the books that blooded us. Yep. Follow us on your favorite podcasting or, you know, like subscribe, I guess, your favorite podcast platform. Follow us on Twitter at Faded Mates or on Instagram at Faded Mates Pod. And you can now buy Faded Mates swag and other Romance Landia swag actually from my best friend on JenReadRomance.com. So there's like Faded Mates button, really cool Romance Landia stuff. And of course, the Year of You Mirrors from Brazen and the Beast. If you were a Brazen and the Beast fan, uh, I am Sarah McLean. And uh, Jen is Jen Prokop. You can find us at Sarah McLean and at Jen Race Romance on Twitter. Uh, Fade Mates is produced by Eric Mortensen. And uh, 